Hello everyone, uh, welcome to co-production with Children and Families. Uh, the Children Act 1989, 30 years on, where are we now? Uh, my name is Ryan Wise, I work uh, here at Sky, the Social Care Institute for Excellence. Uh, I'm a social worker and practice development manager here at Sky. Uh, it's really great to have so many people joining us today, so thank you for that. Um, we have got a stellar lineup for you, and I'm sure the conversation will be very exciting as well. Um, great to see so many people from across the country. I've noticed a strong southwest contingent, which I like. Bit of Devon, Torquay, Cardiff, Bristol, Somerset. Um, but welcome to everyone. Um, to start us off, we're just going to do um, a quick round of introductions. That's me in the really loud shirt. And we'll go <laughs> from the left and say uh, who's in the room today. Uh, my name's uh, Rich Devine, and I'm a social worker from Bath and North East Somerset Council. And, and I'm the one next to Ryan in his really loud shirt. I'm Lee Zivek and I'm a service manager at Bath and North East Somerset. I'm behind the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Chloe, I'm on the next left. Uh, so I'm a care leaver and I now work as a researcher. Um, my name's uh, Tim Fisher and I work at uh, the London Borough of Camden, the Family Good Conference um, and Restorative Practice Service Manager. And that's me sort of leaning forward, looking a bit baffled and confused. Um, I'm also, um, I'm kind of jealous. I feel like um, Ryan's uh, uh, um, uh, outdone me on the shirt front, but I'm respecting it. Hello, everyone. My name's Kate Perudis. I'm the co-production development manager here at Sky. Um, I'm the one with the loud dress. I'm, you can only see half of me, but hopefully the whole of me will be here for the rest of the webinar. Um, I work with organisations who come to Sky asking to know more about co-production, what it is, and also how to do it. And so I'll be talking more about that in the presentation. Great, thank you everyone. Um, so let's get started, and, and for the next hour we want this to be really interactive. Um, so please um, share your comments, your reflections, and your questions, um, and we are going to connect with the web chat, so please use that to connect with each other as well. So, to start us off, um, We've kind of we've shared this is to do with the Children Act and to do with co-production with children and families as well. Um, but to offer some context, um, let's think about the Children Act and what we mean by that. So the Children Act has been 30 years since it was first implemented um, and is the primary legis legislative framework for promoting and safeguarding the welfare of children. And what we mean by that is that it's the primary law that shapes how as a country we care and we look after for our children. Now. One of the core um, parts of the Act is what's called the Paramountcy Principle, um, and this is the overarching thread of the Act. And what it states is that the key focus should always be on the welfare of the child, and this is the dominant idea of the piece of law. Um, but importantly, the Act also states how the state should do this. So how do we promote that welfare of the child? And for me, there's three core ideas. And they are, one, children should be brought up and cared for within their own families. Two, parents with children in need should be helped to bring up children themselves. And three, any help should be provided in partnership with families. And for Sky, this aligns with co-production. And I'm going to quickly just hand over to Kate, who's going to talk us through what we mean by co-production. We think it's really important to um, define what we mean by co-production, because co-production is a quite an emerging and fluid idea. It's been around since the 60s, but there's still a lot of confusion about what it means and certainly how to do it in practice. Um, the Care Act has got a definition, the NHS has got a definition, but here at Sky we say it's about people who use services and carers working with professionals in equal partnerships towards shared goals. Or more simply, it's about working and learning together. And um, the key bit in that definition for me is the equal partnerships, because what we recognise is for too long, professionals have had lots of power. And they have power because they've got resources, they've got a salary, they've got time. People who use services and carers, and also this applies to young people and families, often don't have that. So it's sometimes useful to think about co-production as this, this way of equalising this power imbalance. And what that requires is sharing of power. And I'll talk more about how organisations and individuals can do that later on. Great. Thanks, Kate. Um, so therefore, here at Sky, we think the law is clear. When we work with children and families, we should be working in a co-productive way. 
And today, what we're going to do is break that down, and we're going to hear from all the speakers in the room and hear from you as well about how, how can you do this? How can you do this in practice to embed and develop co-production as set out in the Children Act? And we're going to start uh, with Kate, who's going to share some ideas from Sky. Thank you. Um, so I want to just um, talk a little bit about um, Sky's co-production values. Um, another way of thinking about this is the ingredients that need to be there to make good co-production happen. Um, Organisations often come to us saying, but how do we do co-production? And we encourage them to take a step, sort of rewind a little bit and say, what's important? What needs to be there? What, what does everyone need to sign up to to make co-production happen? So we talk about this set of values, and there's four that we talk about. Equality, diversity, accessibility, and reciprocity. I'm going to take each one in turn. When we say equality, we mean this is about forming more equal partnerships between people who use services, families, young people, children, and the people that um, run the services and professionals. So recognising that each of those groups has got a contribution to make and everyone's input is equal and should be valued equally. It's also about relationships and trust, and that doesn't really happen unless there's openness and honesty. When we talk about diversity, what we're saying is that um, this is about... Co production for co production to work, different groups of people need to be there and being really proactive about involving people who don't normally get involved. No one should be excluded because or involved from a piece of co production work for the reasons of gender, sexuality, age, or ethnicity. And in fact, involving people from these different groups might provide these more unique perspectives and provide helpful approaches to problem solving. If co production is working well, you're going to arrive at new perspectives, and that's only going to come with having different perspectives around sharing their experiences. Accessibility is about understanding and removing barriers that stop people from participating. So it's about thinking about the people that you want to involve and what's stopping them um, from being involved and what support they might need. For example, making sure you don't use complicated words, having buildings that are accessible. But the important thing to remember is that um, having these things are not nice extras or add-ons. Without the right access and support, people simply can't participate. And you would have seen at the start, we've got um, the Sky's Guide to Holding Accessible Meetings. So you can definitely check that out for more tips on running accessible meetings and events. And finally, we talk about reciprocity, which is a bit of a jargon word in my opinion. But what it means is, if you put something in, you get something out. And at a minimum, that means involvement shouldn't cost any people anything, so paying people promptly. But it's also recognising that if professionals are being paid a salary, when uh, young people, carers, old, you know, people who use services, when they're, when they're being involved in a piece of work, they should be rewarded. And that could be through money, um, and it could also be through sharing of networks, being offered training. It's about not taking people's contributions for granted and thinking how to properly reward people. We also know through our, our co-production work with adults, this can somehow sometimes affect people's benefits. So we've put together a briefing about paying people and the benefit system, and we always offer people independent benefits advice through a Citizens Advice Bureau in Bedford. And you would have seen at the start a, a link to paying people who receive benefits and the challenges around that and how to overcome them. Okay, so that's a bit about the values or ingredients that you need. Um, I talked earlier about the different ways that you can share power with people. And some of you might have seen this ladder of co-production. It talks about the different ways that you can engage people and the different ways that you can share power and different levels at which you share power. So let's just briefly go through each rung of the ladder, starting at the bottom. The green is about, it starts off talking about coercion and educating. And what we mean by that is getting people into a room but they're not having any real control or choice over a decision and they might feel forced to accept a particular option. Moving up, the next green rung is educating. This is about people who are using a service being helped to understand it so they can gain knowledge. And the next rung up, we're heading into the orange, is informing. This is about people who are responsible for services informing people who use them about how they work and maybe explaining decisions, but it's still quite one directional in terms of discussion. There's no feedback loops there. Moving up to consultation, this is about when people are asked to complete surveys or attend meetings, but they might have no influence over final decisions. The next rung up is about engagement. This is similar to um, consultation, but people might have more opportunity to express their views, and people running the service might allow them to influence some of the final decisions. 
Moving up to the top of the rung then, the first pink one, which is co-design. This is about people who use services, and I'm using that, that phrase, but it also applies to children and young people and families. This is about involving them in the design of services, and they might have an influence, but they might only be involved at certain points and not involved from the start to the end of either designing or starting a service or reshaping a service. And that's a really key point about co-production. It's involving people from the start when decisions are being made all the way through to the finding innovative ways for them to be involved with delivering a service or being part of a service, all the way to the end, evaluating a service. And that means checking to see that it's, has it achieved what it's set out to do? What difference is it making? Is it actually working? I was just to mm. pause on that point, because we've got a comment from Mike there about the ladder of co-production sits very nicely with the social discipline window, mm. which um, is a feature of uh, restorative practice. And I know, Tim, um, you're part of what you do in Canada is to do restorative practice. So I thought, do you have any comments on Mike's uh, thoughts there about how co-production aligns with the social discipline window? Yeah, I suppose um, the social discipline window is helpful to get us on the footing of working with people um, rather than doing to them. So what um, is it, Tim? Uh, it's like it's a window. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice. It's a window that gives you a perspective. It gives you a view on how you might connect with people differently okay. and how you might work with people differently. So getting onto a setting of um, working with people, learning from them, um, I think I think it does nicely. So I, I would agree with uh, Mike very much. So yeah. that really does look nice as co-production, and that's the top rung, which is very much about working in in equal partnership with people um, and. At, involving them at every stage of the way of a piece of work. And the way that we group those different rungs of the ladder is doing the, the bottom two, so coercion and educating, is very much about doing to people. So this is described as trying to fix people who are passively receiving a service. The orange bits, informing consultation and engagement, we very much classify that as doing for, and that's about keeping people informed, but perhaps not treating them exactly as equals because you're only offering limited choices. The top two rungs are about doing with. This is the gold standard of involvement. It's about working with people in an equal way, in equal partnerships. So is that, I hope that's clear to everybody. And I thought I'd give an example. So my next slide is about a piece of work that we did with Oxfordshire County Council. Um, we helped to um, embed co-production across the whole of adult social care. So after some quite challenging conversations with the Care Quality Commission, uh, Care Quality Commission, the CQC, a couple of years ago, Oxfordshire County Council made a really bold decision which was embed they wanted to work in a co-production way across the whole of adult social care. They recognised this was going to take time so they put two and a half years aside and lots of funding to, to um, work in partnership with Sky to help do that. How we did that to so helping them to work in a more co-production way was we first of all started by doing some mapping. We looked at existing co-production structures and this often happens when we're doing co-production with big complex organisations. We find that co-production is happening in pockets, it's happening in bits and pieces. There isn't really a unified way of things happening but there is examples of good practice. So this mapping allows those good examples to come to the surface and allows a space for people to start sharing what's working well with co-production. And then the next bit of work that we did was we worked with a range of stakeholders, so local people, council officers, senior managers. Um, we actually identified seven key shifts we wanted to see. So what we meant by that was what changes are going to happen within Oxfordshire County Council as a result of working in a co-production way. And then we reduced these further to four. And I'm going to go through a couple of them. So the first one was we wanted to embed co-production across... Oxfordshire County Council and what that means is co-production being the way that Oxfordshire County Council does things um, and that was through setting up, we did this through setting up a co-production board which is made up of people who use services and carers, citizens, the co-production team, we helped to recruit a co-production team to do co-production work across the local authority but the board was actually made up of direct, the director of adult social care and senior commissioners and people from Sky. So it's people at all levels steering this co-production way of working. I just got um, a really yeah. good question, question there from Rachel, yeah. uh, which is going to open up to the group. Um, it's a, a really interesting one about how does the ladder of co-production mm. um, fit with the ways in which practice directly interacts with children and families? The example there, so the ladder when we think about when the work, worker walks into my home, I just wondered any comments from the group on that? That That is something we kind of talk about in our slides, about that challenge of how to work co-productively in statutory services mm. and I guess it's 
so for me, I think that's illustrated through, in some ways, through family group conference, in which you'll mm. know more than me about Tim. But that kind of um, trying to work, that commitment to work alongside families and that aspiration to work co-productively and that just morally and ethically it's a better way of achieving certain outcomes. Thanks, Lee. Okay, and then the way that we, um, the other, one of the other key shifts or aims of the co-production work was to improve services across adult social care. And we did this through supporting co-produced projects, co-evaluating services with people who use them, um, and training um, uh, and training staff and people who use services. And I think that's a key point to what you've just said, Lee, because I think you need to empower people um, and train staff at all levels to do co-production well and this leads nicely to this idea of culture change which I think is a big part of co-production because often you get frontline staff who've got really brilliant intentions but they're being held back by the systems that they're working within so co-production is about coming up with a co-production plan for the whole of the um, organisation and that's what we supported Oxfordshire County Council to do. We also um, got two peer researchers so people who were actually users of services being involved in the research process and they took part they actually led focus groups and interviews were involved with the write-up and the reporting um, and another bit of work that we're doing recently um, is and, and more about the key shifts and our interim findings and our research and evaluation around the difference that co-production is making in Oxfordshire can be found on our website and Oxfordshire County Council's website a recent bit of work that was really interesting for me was in, um, in Kirk Leaves. They decided they wanted to go down a similar path to Oxfordshire, but they actually said we actually want to take a step back. We want to define co-production with local people, citizens. So we actually were involved with running a workshop facilitating having these discussions with local people. What does it mean for the community as well as the council? So coming up with a shared definition of co-production is a great way to start. Um, and in Durham, um, I recently ran some advanced co-production training with a group of people involved with commissioners, uh, people involved with commissioning and procurement, um, and they told a story about how they were coming up with a, a policy for paying carers, and they presented a reference group, a group of carers with three possible solutions, and the group actually tore up the bit of paper and said, this is not genuine co-production because you're coming up to us with some predetermined ideas. Co-production is about a blank sheet of paper, and that links to my final slide, which should talk about the guiding principles for co-production and also our learning points. The key starting point is that people who are close to the problem are often part of, very close to the solution. Um, and it's about um, viewing them as part of the solution. It's also about co-production being this blank sheet of paper, which is about, which well, can be a very scary place for people working in big, complex organisations who've got very strict ways of doing things. But it is a culture shift. You have to kind of work with people to populate and um, come up with ideas together. If co-production is working well, what I love best is when I walk into a room, I don't know who's um, the young person, the family member, who's the carer, who's the, ser the service, the person who uses the service, service, and I don't know who the professional is. When co-production is working well, there's a blurring of boundaries, and that means there's a shift away from professionals having all the answers to professionals being facilitators who help guide conversations and solutions to come up with together. And finally, if co-production is working well, it is challenging and it is uncomfortable because it is a whole new way of working. And the director of adult social services, the previous director, Kate Tironi, often shared about how challenging she found it, but that's because it was a completely radical shift in a new way of doing things. Thanks, Kate. Um, it's great to see um, a really good conversation going on in the web chat there, and I think that some great points. And I think something that really stuck out um, from Asia there about all workers with children and families have a responsibility to hear their voice and take action. And I really love that kind of take action um, element. It really chimes with some of the work that I know is going on in Camden about being that activist. So I'm going to hand over to Tim now. He's going to um, tell you a bit about his perspective from Camden and, and how they are going about developing and embedding co-production. Okay. Uh, great, thank you. It's really nice to be um, to be with everyone, you know. And I, I sort of want to do... How, how do they do it on pirate radio? Where people, well, like you do shout outs to people you know because it's like I'm seeing all like names of people that I know. I can't see all the names that have tuned in, but um, I can see Simon from Leeds and, and Andrea uh, and Anne Marie Douglas, I'm connected to. Um, Kevin, who was on our last, um, Kevin Mack is there. Um, and also Becky, who we've been connecting with recently um, on Twitter. So it, it's, it's really nice to be with you. And, and that photo there that you can see. 
is us um, under the banner of to love is to act um, which we think uh, is a slogan and some words which mean something to us about participation and how we might talk about um, co-production um, and uh, this is like um, do you like my picture of a boat? <laughs> 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 um, so uh, this is a beautiful, beautiful thing where this um, a young person activist, <coughs> Ma Michael C. Clarke, um, I heard him talking the other day and he broke down the word relationship, uh, relation and ship, and talked about a relationship being a, um, a voyage of trust. Um, and uh, it does make me think a bit about those boats and like a holiday I had as a child where I actually fell into the river. But um, <laughs> maybe, we won't, maybe we won't go into that so much. Um, but I think for, for us, um, uh, the, the journey of participation, and we do talk about our social work as a journey, uh, Martin Pratt, our executive director, talks about it being a journey. And it has been a kind of a voyage or a journey. And it, for me, it's been a bit like um, an... Uh, Sure. Um, it's, it's been a process of participation unfolding um, as um, one event or something significant happens um, on, on top of something else. So um, new ideas, new developments, um, new events have been coming all the time, but they've always been coming on, on top of something else. So there's always unrealized potential there. Um, as, as our work and as our um, uh, collective efforts um, unfold. Um, and um, I think starting with the accepting uh, equality, um, accepting the value uh, of people. You know, um, John Berger said that uh, we should refuse to judge people, we should judge actions. And I think that's a good, um, a good starting point for us, um, I suppose you know the features of our our journey of participation have been about building trust and trusting people. And you can see that quote there from Adrian Marie Brown when she talks about moving at the speed of trust, focus on critical connections more than critical mass, build the resilience by building the relationships, less prep, more presence. What you pay attention to grows. Tim, can I just bring in um, Susan's point um, about a question, which I'd like to have a think about if that's the right. Um, so Susan's got a question there about when there are divergent views among those using services. So how can a service mediate different uh, or at times competing views from service users in terms of a broad service design during a co-production process? Is that something that resonates with your experiences, Tim? It does, you know, I mean, um, about six years ago, um, we uh, started having coffee mornings and um, the people that came together were, were parents um, who had uh, experience of the child protection system in Camden um, and um, they uh, at the start they were coming together and you know they had some really divergent views from some of the social workers and professionals in Camden there was some anger there there were some perspectives um, and um, through that uh, a process of trust and them getting to understand that we really were listening um, we really did were recognizing power we really were prepared to kind of open up spaces to reflect together um, and to value what they had to say um, it, that, that was the journey that we've gone on um, really and so you look at, at where we are now with this sort of emergence of parent activism, of young people activism, and you've got people like Clarissa Stevens, um, Faye Hamilton, um, who are doing terrific work in um, sharing their experiences, but also um, developing common understandings of, of of not just what happened to them, but also you know what's happening more broadly in. In, a, in, in, in our helping systems. Uh, can I also add to that, Tim? I think um, a lot of the work that we do, because I come from a disability rights background, and sometimes people present with really challenging behaviour because they've been disempowered their whole lives, and it requires sort of careful facilitation. And that comes down to sort of staff having the right training and support to work with communities and not throwing someone's comments because they're being made in potentially yeah. an aggressive way 
their views should still be heard and incorporated. Yeah, and it's got, I mean, you've got to kind of meet people where they're at. And yeah. um, I mean, back to the Berger thing, he talks about tenderness. Mm. You know, we've got to have a tenderness and appreciation for people and for, for, for what they're saying. And we've got to really um, genuinely listen. I mean, I think time is, is important as well and valuing. Um, I had a, an experience the other day. So in the, in the Children Act um, was a um, uh, independent visiting, was a specification in, in, in the Children Act that, that children in care, if they weren't seeing their family, then they um, uh, uh, should have the chance to meet up with, with, with somebody regularly, somebody independent. And I don't think that's been widely implemented as much as it should coming out of the Children Act, but actually, um, kind of because they were doing it in my area, uh, I um, started independent visiting in Cardiff about 14 years ago, and I, I happened to see the young person um, the other day, I went out to see him, something difficult had happened in his life, uh, his mother uh, had died recently, so I took a trip out to see him. I went there in my um, electric car, which um, I, broke, uh, I broke down on the way back, so I went out of energy, my, my friend said to me that um, I'd been... Um, Virtue signalling too hard <laughs> <laughs> and overusing the indicator. Should but, have um, <laughs> I should have got on my boat. Yeah, Ryan says I should have got on my canal boat. Um, but what 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 kind of um, that really experience was like for me was I was listening to him talking about his mother dying, and he was learning me about that life experience, experience that I haven't had, and that was like radically. Um, it, that wasn't about necessarily developing Cameron services, but it was radically co-productive for me because he was bringing me into new understandings and a new space and a new, a new sort of emotional space that I hadn't that I hadn't been before. And we we talk about a lot about language in in Camden. Um, you saw the slogan "To love is to act." We also talk about thinking and feeling um, as well. And those um, parent activists, those young people activists, are helping us think and feel. Um, maybe a thing, final thing to mention from me is the Camden Conversations work and so this is the Family Advisory Board uh, wanting to um, influence our practice and change our services in a more fundamental way so um, Annie from Surviving Safeguarding, Professor Gupta from Royal Holloway um, helped us on this uh, and it was a, a a radical move, participatory research, um, where parents interviewed other parents, um, parents interviewed other professionals in the system, and they came up with um, a series of recommendations. Now, that for me is, has been a really interesting journey and continues to be a journey. I had a conversation yesterday with one of the child protection chairs in Camden, who initially, um, it was quite difficult to talk to about Camden Conversations, and now she wants to volunteer to be part of the uh, group that are helping to implement it. So I think we're all kind of turning towards um, the ideas um, of participation, of, of co-production. And I think um, feeling it as well as thinking it is really important. Just wanna... um, and, and just to say a, a final so, so just to say one <laughs> final thing. <laughs> And a recommendation is like, it's, you know, what does it feel like? I think sort of getting unstuck, embracing change, feeling the excitement of it. You know what I mean? When somebody, I mean, Kevin Mack says this brilliantly, you know, the feeling of getting surprised, the feeling of moving into an unknown uh, area where you don't know what necessarily the destination is. I think that's, fu that's fun. It's exciting. And making that move. And, um, and Becca Dove, you know, my... Um, brilliant, valued um, collaborator, uh, you know, the, this idea around relational activism to love is to act, you know, we've got to be curious, we've got to connect, we've got to examine everyday interactions and share stories, so, you know, that's that's the first thing we've got to do, we've got to do something, we've got to reach the part of the system that we can reach and do it. Thanks Tim, really nice point to end on, and talking about Becca, um, there's, two, there's two questions that, that I want to just well, I want to kind of focus on Becca, but there was a, there's so much going on in the chat, which is great, uh, which I'm struggling to keep track of, but there was a question quite a far, far back, actually. So, one well, first question that I want to ask the group is the importance of cultural competency in co-production. So that's the first one I want the group to think about. And secondly, um, Becca's point there, um, is co-production power sharing 
power shifting or power recognizing? So those two questions, just, just a quick two minutes on that. Has anyone got any thoughts on either of those two questions? I'll pick up on the last one. Yeah, um, I think it's all of them. You need to recognize, the first step is that you need to recognize that you've got more power than the people that you're working with. Um, and then you need to try and shift that power towards sharing. So mm. it is, it's all of them to me. And I think it works both ways. It's um, professionals giving up um, yeah. power, but it is also people who use services, young people, families recognising they've got power. And for some people, that can be quite a new radical thing. They need to be supported to understand it and um, use it in a beneficial way. It's also recognising, I mean, we're approached by organisations all the time who say, we want to train our staff to do co-production. And we say, well, where are your budgets and resources and time to think about supporting your local citizens and young people to be involved in this? Okay. Anyone got any ideas about cultural competency in co-production? Any thoughts on that? That comes back to diversity, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think um, your family group conference was mentioned earlier, and I know there's some Leeds colleagues um, on the um, on the chat. Uh, they might want to comment on this with the brilliant work that they do in the area of family group conference. But you know, if, if in co-production we need to build a bridge and get closer to the community, closer to people, um, then sometimes you know, then we'll need to do that. In a, in, in a culturally competent, culturally appropriate way. So I think I'm re it really gives me um, pleasure when we get a referral for a family group conference in, in Camden. Uh, it's a Bengali family. Uh, they want a Bengali speaking coordinator and then we've, we've got those in London and we can say your, your family group conference is going to be facilitated um, by a Bengali speaking um, coordinator. It's also about recognising that it's not about having information available in every single language out there, but you having the processes and systems in place where when someone does request um, information in Bengali or you know conferencing in Bengali, that you've got that in place. Thank you. Um, so we're going to move on to our um, next uh, speaker who's going to present, and that's Chloe. Um, so Chloe, over Thank to you. you. Thank you. Um, okay, yeah. So I just want to start with. Uh, some thinking around approach, um, and that's plays a couple of points on thinking. Really, I think there's a lot to be benefited um, on both sides. Um, when I first started getting involved in this kind of work, um, I was uh, a care leaver working with local authorities, and I was quite shocked to find out how many people really care about this stuff um, and are working really hard on it. Um, and that can be quite heartwarming and quite quite a shift. Um, and I know that the professionals I work with are quite shocked to find out that I didn't know that. Um, so it was quite empowering and quite kind of life changing for me. And I think it's worth recognizing how important uh, that is. Um, I think that both views are needed. Um, neither side have all the answers, and it does need to be a partnership. Um, it kind of comes back to that doing with, not to kind of stuff that Kate touched on earlier. Um, Something that I really want to pick up on is the, the different experiences of the system that people are going to be coming in with. Um, so people who are in receipt of services are, are going to come in as whole people, like this, this is our lives that we're talking about, um, and they don't have that professional boundary that um, people who work in the system have, and I just think it's really important to, to be aware of that difference. Um, and I suppose, uh, lastly, I just want to get across that it's okay to make mistakes and the important thing is to just be honest about where you are um, and try to answer questions honestly. So if somebody asks, like, why, why can't we do things this way? Just explaining how the system works. They, they can only help if they actually understand what's going on. Um, and just asking for their feedback and being, being willing to adapt as you go along is really important. Um, yeah, so the main things I want to focus on um, are two things really. So the first one is around accessibility, um, which is just about enabling people to engage and understand. Um, so firstly, I want to touch on language and materials that you use. So ideally, you'd, you'd co-produce ahead of using them. Um, I think people are talking more about now about the fact that we use a lot of acronyms in local government and the charity mm -hmm. sector, um, and it, it can be really meaningless to other people. Um, so that's that's one level that's kind of out there. But something I really want to highlight is how damaging uh, language can be. So describing a child as being eligible for a service or being referred to as a service user. Um, I noticed that I try not to do this anymore, but I noticed when I introduced myself earlier, I started with care leaver. And like, I'm a researcher and a musician, and I happen to have been in care, um, but I always focus on the care leader service user thing because I've been doing this work for a long time and I just think it's worth kind of
kind of flagging that that stuff gets really stuck in your head. So if you can find other language to use, that can be helpful. Um, and yeah, I think it's about just using language that everyone relates to, really. So just things that are simple and clear and human. So you might start by breaking down the meaning of the, the, the daily language that you use um, and then maybe co-produce the language that you'll use as a group might be a way of overcoming that. Um, so I want to, somebody said something, I can't remember who it was, sorry, but somebody brought something up earlier about having options and not everybody will be able to engage with the co-production, um, but they might still want to be involved. Um, and I think that's, that's a really good point. Um, hard to reach voices are really valuable. Um, and I think a, a big barrier from my perspective has been a, a lack of trust in the system. Um, so there's a project called New Belongings, which is actually the first project I uh, worked on. Um, and that's in its third phase now. It's been run by Karam. If you haven't heard of it, I definitely recommend looking it up. Um, the premise of that is they basically have a core team of care leavers who engage with a wider pool of care leavers in the local area. So that kind of breaks down that lack of engagement. Um, and I think also having options, so things like having a survey to capture and understand why the data about things that are going on in the area can be really helpful. Um, and social workers can be um, really crucial in that. So enabling social workers to understand what's going on and that you do want to do co-production and shift things around a bit. Um, they can be the kind of link to people. Um, and the families that you co-produce with could be supported to engage with other families. I think that would be really valuable. Um, so some of the work that I do at Traverse, where I work now, we're um, quite focused on inclusive practice and there's a lot of value in working with community groups who know the area and know the people and they can kind of support and advise. So I'd really recommend looking for people who are already connected to the people that you want to work with. Um, I mean, be mindful not to out people, um, but yeah, approaching um, people who they're already connected to can be really helpful. I was gonna, thank you for that. I was going to bring in a question here. Um, there's a question up there um, to open up to the group. Um, about what, what is people's experiences about having challenges with other professionals? So when trying to kind of introduce co-production or work with communities to become more co-productive, um, have people faced uh, challenges from other professionals um, who, who don't work in a co-production way? Perhaps, yeah. And, and how did we? How did you overcome that? Or kind of any any idea of that? Um, I suppose. Uh, what, one of the transitions that I've had to make as an individual practitioner after spending several years within the child protection system is to recognise the uh, inherently harmful aspects of the system from which I operate within. And I read a book, um, uh, Protecting Children, The Social Model by Featherstone and Sue White and Morris and Gupter. And, and it was an extremely challenging book because of um, its recognition of how difficult and constrained and sometimes difficult the system is that, that I've participated in. And so that's it. So, so when we're talking about other professionals not willing to work co-productively, uh, I have to recognise that I was one of those professionals in not, in not so long ago. Um, and in the same way that we need to create space and dialogue for parents and children to bring their different perspectives. We also need to, I suppose, create that space for the other professionals. Um, it's also about challenging as well. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a culture that doesn't allow this co-production to happen, flagging it and just saying this is this is damaging because of this reason and showing the impact it's having, showing coming up with solutions through your practice, your daily practice about how it could be done differently. Um, but I think it also links to another question that came up from, from Linda about co-production being seen as the co-production team's responsibility. Mm -hmm. If it's working well, it should run across the whole organisation. It's not just one team or one individual responsibility. Um, did you have anything to say? Because we, we recently ran a workshop with children and young people to ask them their thoughts about our co-production with children offer, if you like, the work that we're doing in Sky. And you were part of that. And mm -hmm. something yeah. that came along was, something that came out of that for me was people saying, we want to be involved with designing co-production activities. So actually being involved with interview panels, having that visibility through the organisation. Yeah, going across the whole system. Not, I mean, I was going to touch on this in, in, um, in the presentation anyway, but I, I think it's about um, 
letting people be involved in all aspects rather than coming in with your agenda and your set question of, of what you want to ask because that restricts the what you're doing and it's not really co-production to me um yeah i i think i'll just i mean payment and reciprocity has been uh, touched on but i think it is really important to recognize that that everyone's working hard um and there is no ideal set way of doing payment and um, everyone's kind of grappling with this at the moment um, but I think it's just about explicitly acknowledging that everyone's working and just figuring out together how people can be kind of rewarded for that. I love um, the idea that you've, you just mentioned there about bringing people in and not training them to become more like the professionals. Yes. Um, yeah, that's my big gripe. Um, <laughs> I can just skip to that. So there's this, there's this really great video um, called The Parable of Blobs and Squares. Um, it's, it's brilliant. If you've not seen it, look it up. It's um, narrated by Brian Blessed. Um, it's course. so brilliant. Why not? Um, but yeah, it basically shows how bringing people in from the community that you serve into the established culture just creates more of the same. Um, so I would strongly recommend trying not to do that. Um, I think that it's being aware that levelling the playing field is something I really wanted to pick up on. It's being aware that as an established culture and a team of people that already know each other and already work together um, and the families that you work with may have never met before. Um, so giving them the space to get to know each other and letting them have a team will shift some of that power imbalance. It will allow them to kind of build confidence um, and support each other to consider what they want to say so they can say what they mean in meetings. Um, and just having that support network can create some resilience to, to some of the stress and the upset that they might find as well. There is a lot of emotional labour involved with people when they're talking about their lives um, in the framing of a service. Um, and I suppose the, having a, a, a community and having a, a big group um, creates that diversity of voices. Often a lot of, you get maybe a handful of people um, being the kind of reps um, of whatever cohort they represent. And I think it's important to have bigger teams so they don't feel like they're representing this entire thousands of people. Um, and so that you get those disagreements because that's where you get the learning and the understanding. And I think there's a question up here which links to that from uh, Jess Walker about care leavers supporting other care leavers and this idea about peer support is a really mm. intrinsic part mm. of co-production. Yeah, I think that's really important. Um, yeah, that, ba that basically covers everything that I really wanted to, to get across. Thank Thanks, you. Um, and um, we're doing our okay for time actually, so keep going with your um, questions. It's great to see that the chat um, is continuing to um, be a really good debate. Uh, we're going to move on to a um, presentation now by Richard um, and Lee, who are from Bath and North East Somerset, uh, and they're going to focus on their uh, perspective and experience of um, developing co-production. Uh, can I just say thank you, because I've got a list of things that I have got to look up, and I'm <laughs> so it's been really uh, interesting. Um, I suppose just to start by saying that Rich and I are representatives of a, a group of people from Bath and North East Somerset who are trying to support a different way of working with parents and carers um, and we are trying to think about how we can work collaboratively and promote more advocacy and co-production in Bath and North East Somerset. So we um, set up our parental advocacy group which the parents and carers named as building bridges but that was kind of following on what, from what Chloe said there's a brilliant woman called um, Penny McKissick who runs Southside and she's um, a voluntary organisation and she's been working with a group of parents and carers in that kind of way for decades so yeah so we kind of linked she's supported us massively where we are currently. And I think what that reflects is that there are these kind of um charities and, and organisations that are already working co-productively yeah. within the communities from which they're serving um, and, and so it's useful as a beginning place to perhaps get in contact with those different charities or those different community yeah. settings and see what's already um, set up in your, in your local authority or your area. Because I think we've learned a lot from her all Ready, even though we're really at the start of our journey really. Um, so the, the intention of, for our group it was to kind of create a space for parents who have been through child protection systems to support other parents but also to try and create change and to help us learn to do things differently. Like I said we're in the really early stages of that but our slides really are just kind of illustration of some of the ideas and 
principles that have kind of guided us. So we picked this slide from Alex Fox, who we heard talk when we came to Camden. Mm, that's right. Yes, yeah. he, so he was really inspirational. And I guess this is just about um, how important the language we use is and how that sometimes we can say that we're working co-productively and we use those words, but actually it doesn't kind of represent changes in behaviour. And I think that follows on from some of what we've talked about today about the change in the culture and just a note of caution. Because I guess I would say... In terms of the ladder that you showed, Kate, we're probably at the kind of engagement stage with an aspiration to work towards co-production, but I wouldn't claim to be there. I think it's just a useful reminder for us to bring some humility into yeah. our endeavours to be co-productive and, and to be clear that whilst we use the term co-production, that's very much a, an aspiration of ours rather than uh, an outcome that we can claim to have achieved and um, and it's just expressing a kind of caution against language which sometimes gets co-opted and commodified within mm -hmm. children's services in a way that the term ends up being divorced from the underpinning ethics and principles and values that underpin it. Um, and then the next slide is from a brilliant um, TED talk by Hilary Cotton and I guess this so I, it was to illustrate some of the challenges that with statutory services and co-production and some of the, the challenges that that brings and the issues and the anxieties that can raise and the safety that processes and procedures bring to organisations. And So it's just to illustrate some of those challenges but still kind of being aspirational to strive towards um, how we can work with parents differently. And I think an important part that we would like to, to highlight is the need to stand in communities. And I think in, in recent years within social work, there's been a kind of geographical distancing of social workers from the communities from which they serve. Even, for example, where we work in Baines, we're centralised in, in, uh, in a big office that's and then we drive into the communities and so we don't have the same type of relationships that we did or, or some of us have when we've worked within the areas. And and when you stand in the communities, there's also, you, you have to create an openness to be criticised mm -hmm. um, and, and often in conflicting ways, uh, there's not a kind of uniform or agreement around the criticism. And, um, Just going to bring in a question there, which is a bit of a, a, bit of a curve. Though. Um, but I think it relates to what we've been talking about. Um, a specific question from uh, Mike, I think it was, about kind of moving on from engagement in child protection conferences mm. um, to being more co-productive. Um, mm. Any ideas or kind of um, examples people want to share in their experience with that? So we are trying to... Um, so we do have a small family group conference service in Baines, and we are trying to have that the plan that parents, families produce in the family group conference and how that follows them and that's their plan and how that can be used within child protection processes. Again, we're very, you know, we haven't got this all tied up nicely, but that we're, that's where at the start of that journey of thinking how that plan can, that family's plan can follow them through those systems and processes. Tim, you, you yeah, that? yeah. I mean, I think that's an interesting one at the moment. The child protection conference. Um, there are local authorities that are making strong efforts to hold family group conferences or building alternative pathways and areas like Leeds and Kensington and Chelsea, where they've sought special permission um, to uh, uh, to um, delay the child protection conference to to facilitate. Um, a family group conference. I think there's also a lot of thinking around, including our Camden Conversations report, but also other local authorities. Um, I had a meeting the other day with some London boroughs, Oxfordshire, Hertfordshire. All of these local authorities are thinking about how parents are consistently telling us that their experience of CP conferences is oppressive and uncomfortable and difficult. So are there some other things that we can do with that meeting? Mm -hmm. um, there's a school of thought that that 
that actually the setting needs to be different, that mm. there needs to be food, the rooms might need to be different, there might not, maybe there's not a table there. The so timing. That's, the timing. Yeah. Um, and there's also some, and this, these were some of the recommendations, uh, so what's happening in Camden currently, just small, you might call them a relate, like a relational change where, for example, the chairs are staying in touch with the um, a, a parent uh, and, and, and the child in between the, the child protection conferences, so between the initial and the review. The chairs are kind of having a phone call or a visit and staying in touch. Oh, sorry. I think that's been an, a change. Samuel, mm. sorry about that. Acronyms, um, we're not yes. practicing what we preach. Um, mm. An FGC is a family group conference. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, um, and also, to... more widely as well, within Norfolk, um, I've been hearing examples about, aside from the Children in Care Council that they've set up there, it, they're also involving children and young people in the whole of commissioning cycle and procurement. So they're training young commissioners as well. So it's thinking widely, much more widely beyond kind of um, family group conferences and some of the amazing initiatives we're talking yeah. about today. I just want to raise a question that came up earlier um, from Sam. I thought this was about the Children's Act. Mm. So, uh, yeah, it's a really good point, Sam, about how it all ties together. And I think we, we've gone down a particular route today to think more about how to embed co-production. And I think the view of um, Sky specifically is that co-production, if, if we're working in that way, we're actually following what legislation sets out, and that is to actually work in partnership with families. And we can spend a lot of time thinking about how over the last 20 years, or perhaps longer, that's not been the case. Mm -hmm. So we've actually invested in quite defensive and risk-averse practice, which has separated the state from families. And families, I don't think it's too strong to say, have been demonised. And what we're starting to see, in my opinion, is a shift to thinking about, let's work differently, let's work more humanely, and actually using the term love is actually quite radical at the moment, and, and actually, should it be? Should I think, I, think um, I mean, uh, Margaret Wheatley talks about all change results from a change in meaning, so how people, those values in the original Children Act about, about participation, um, obviously haven't carried through in all organisations, in all relationships, in all interactions that people have with the state and with local authorities and with professionals. So we need to like re-imbue meaning into those words and into that language all the time and establish meanings and common understandings locally and nationally about what this stuff means. I don't think it's enough to throw out the, the lovey-dovey words without mm. actually pointing to what we're actually doing and, how, and that's, you know, to love is to act. What actions are we taking to be genuinely participative? And I'm a big fan of showing and not telling. And the reason that we're talking about co-production with all our adults, work that we're doing already, that we've been doing, doing at Sky for 15 years, is that we have these structures. We've got a co-production network. We've got a steering group that meets every two months. Is it time we had something similar, perhaps, for, for young people and children? That's why we're having these conversations and we're co-producing our whole children's approach. And I think... Um, uh, Jill talked about comfort zone and how co-production is outside mm -hmm. of the comfort zone of some professions. And I think giving people the experience of co-production is is um, a way to bring about culture change, I think. I mean, we had a whole service meeting um, last month, which was led by young people and parents, with all like a whole service meeting for all the social workers, for all the managers in the children's services. And that's something that wouldn't have happened um, and it ha hadn't happened until that point. And so that the experience that social workers um, and, and colleagues got that day, um, that the, the, the direct the feelings about what it was like, uh, I think are, um, are, are going to be important in changing the culture. And just Sorry. back to you guys, I know we're, we're pushed for time, and I know that you've got a few more slides left, so over to you, Rich and Lee. I was just going to say something about what Tim said about those feelings and how powerful that is mm -hmm. and the impact that has on people and then that provides the impetus to yeah. want to change things. Yeah. Yeah. I really echo that. I think yeah. that I, I would encourage people to bring more of their whole selves yeah. into the rooms. It does have an mm -hmm. emotional impact on you as well. I think it's, it's valuable to connect with people and be honest about that. And like what you said in your slides, Chloe, about we're human beings. Yeah. 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 And no one's only ever just got one side to that. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I guess we um, wanted to conclude this slide um, to try and think about how we're trying to see the families as experts in their situations. And I, some of my experience from 
um, the beginnings of our group is some of hearing their stories and some of it is very raw and they are angry and mm. just trying to um, meet them where they are and heal that with compassion and kindness and it's about trying to redistribute some of the power dynamics is some of the what we're trying to do with the group. Yeah, and and as we've said, we're very much at the beginning of this process. And um, but but there's a, a as Featherstone and her colleagues point out, there's these transformative approaches that are available to us if we can create the space and, and openness to engage with them. Um, and then there's one more final slide, um, which is by. Um, David Tobis, who who wrote this book from Pariahs to Partners, and if you if you want to learn about advocacy within the child protection system yeah. and the effects that it can potentially have, I'd I'd highly recommend this book. Um, and one of the quotes is around this not just being a matter of sort of justice and sympathy, although I would say that it self evidently is. Um, it's it's critically an important thing to do to help children. Um, and, and I suppose it's, uh, there's an ethical and moral, moral stance to it, but there's mm. also a very pragmatic and real um, endeavour to try and improve the lives of the children and families that we're working with through, through this approach. There's um, also a bottom line argument. If you involve people, you're going to have services that better meet their needs. It's going to be less waste. And yeah. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, I think it's a really powerful point to kind of draw us onto our final slide. So. Um, yeah, I wish we had longer actually. We've got four it's minutes it's, it's a shame we don't um, have an hour and a half, but I think perhaps we don't have the time here and, and perhaps this is more points to reflect on uh, and to consider um, as a group and also those on still on the web chat about what will the next 30 years of the Children Act look like uh, and how far will we get with, with partnership working? Um, so I suppose there's four questions there which we, I think we should all think about as a sector, about where are we heading? How can we develop this positive move towards more co-production further? And what are the enablers for that to happen? And what might we have to overcome? Can I just chime in on that? Of course. I think there's something that we've already touched on that's really important. There's the, the deconstructing. Like we've got all these brilliant things like asset-based practice and person-centered approaches, which I completely agree with in theory. Um, but depending on who's got that bit of paper in their hand, it, it varies in how that's delivered. And I think you've got this, the Children's Act came out in 1989. And we're, st we're still not working in partnership with families, so it's, it's written down, but I think mm. the, the, the key enabler is going to be pulling apart the language and pulling apart our actual yeah. practices. Mm. Thank you, Chloe. I, 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 really I, 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 I think I might have seen a little glimpse of the future uh, the other day because I was at a meeting which um, Becca Dove was instrumental in organising, a, a full circle meeting, which is a, 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 a resident or citizen-led family group conference, so it was a peer uh, family Good Conference organiser that, 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 that was facilitating this meeting. The meeting was in, in the community in an old um, shop space and um, I was there um, I guess as, as an, an as, uh, observer in some ways but they passed the uh, microphone around the room and um, as I introduced myself, I thought I'd say that I'm a social worker and I got booed, yeah? <laughs> um, <okay. laughs> um, but what was in, what I liked about it was that we had that conversation, it was kind of a jokey boo, but I mean they meant it, they meant, they meant it, but we had that conversation, actually if we're going to kind of remove some of the, the stigma uh, and if we're going to work together in partnership, we've got to be in the community, we've got to be taking those boos and like having, having that dialogue. I think it's also about, this is the start of a discussion we're having in Sky, please look out for stuff on the Sky website, because website, we've had brilliant comments today, but we'd really like to capture more. So this is the start of our work within Children Co-Production at Sky. Yeah, and I think what, what we'll do is just to, we will um, send out the slides, we send the web chat as well, so, oh no, perhaps we, perhaps we don't, I'm getting a shake of the head from my comms colleagues, so um, ignore me there. Um, yeah, we'll definitely send out the slides and we'll definitely send out some links about what we've been talking about today. Um, and then let's just end on Kevin's point there about Tim did get booed, lol, but we love him. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> That's nice to end with love, yeah, I endorse that. How, um, how yeah. Guys, thank, thank you everyone for tuning in, um, we hope that was useful. Um, we're 
we want to continue this conversation. I know some of us in the room are um, a bit obsessed by Twitter, so if you want to kind of engage on Twitter, please do. Um, but there are other forums apart from Twitter. But yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and yeah, hopefully keep up the conversation and get in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.